We have originally developed this technology for compound semiconductor and silicon-based power devices. And when we roughly started five years ago to uh, give this idea of using a rigid carrier to, to the CMOS uh, industry, we encountered a lot of uh, process steps that happen between bonding and debonding, which gave challenges. So at that time, we decided to work closer with a material supplier, Brewer Science, and to address these challenges. And today, we have several 300 millimeter equipment sets installed. Uh, but still, it is very customer dependent. And the tool sets that are used between bonding and debonding at a specific fab are not always the state of the art tools uh, we uh, qualify the processes for. So there is still challenges. So even though the bonding and the debonding is mm -hmm. fully qualified, mm -hmm. uh, it has to be fully qualified for each individual customer right. okay. because the processes are different. And yeah, to support that, we have expanded our demo facilities worldwide into business units that provide process development mm -hmm. and even pilot line volume uh, manufacturing so we can bond and debond for customers mm -hmm. and they can qualify the process. So we found a strategic alliance mm -hmm. uh, works best in developing a solution for customers. So you customers. work with individual customers on there as opposed to sort of a global solution? It is a global solution for the CMOS industry. Uh, however, if we work within a consortia like EMC 3D yeah. mm -hmm. in qualifying our processes, okay then the other equipment suppliers within this consortia are using the latest equipment, for example. Based on our experience and other people that we've talked to in the development area, the, the thin wafer handling seems to have inherent problems. It seems to have major yield effects. Um, that's why we do a bond then thin, because we're always then on a very stiff um, but you still permanent. have to do the debond process. We never unless debond. You're, doing wafer, you're only doing wafer to wafer, then I take it. No, we can do dye to wafer, and we can, uh, at some level, we could do dye to dye, but that's a more complicated conversation. And you're doing a permanent bond? We do permanent bonds only. If you're thinning to 10 or 15 microns, like what we do, I don't think that there is any unbondable material that you can use that will keep the, the dye or the wafer from moving. From what we've seen, because of the inherent stresses in the silicon, once you thin it, if it's not on a very firm fixed surface, it moves. And I, 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 I have not seen a material which can hold the silicon in place well enough for you to thin it, bond it to something else permanently, and then let go of it. I would agree with you if you go very thin, like 5, 10 micron, a process flow that permanently bonds and thins afterwards is currently the, the only one that, that can work. Uh, however, what we see in the industry is that a majority is interested in temporary bonding and debonding, and they look at thickness ranges today of 50 to 100 micron. So these are wafer thicknesses that cannot be handled anymore without a rigid carrier, but the Temporary bonding and debonding gives our customers much greater flexibility mm -hmm. in developing their process flow. And we have applications where we flip a wafer after processing one side, the thinned wafer we transfer it to another carrier. And by doing that in certain memory applications, but also image sensor applications, uh, we could enable certain things that are not possible with permanent bonding right away. What are the advantages and disadvantages of dye to wafer versus wafer to wafer, and which is likely to be adopted most widely in high volume manufacturing? The way we look at it at Semitech is again, we use a cost model. You know, that's one of the yardsticks we use for manufacturability. And in the cost model is a yield calculation. And if you look at yield, unless it's a device that has very, very high yield, it's very hard to stack. Mm -hmm. you know, good dyes consistently on top of other good dyes in mm -hmm. a wafer-to-wafer -wafer approach. Mm -hmm. So 
this gets into a whole new discussion of you know making sure that your yield is high what do you do from a design point of view mm -hmm. redundancy and so on but if you don't go down that path mm -hmm. if you look at devices that we have today then for a majority of them you probably would want to do some kind of a screening before mm -hmm. you bond them mm -hmm. because you don't want a dead stack at the mm -hmm. end of it that's the number one reason that points you towards diet away for mm -hmm. apart from that if you go again towards you know through true 3D integration, which is heterogeneous mm -hmm. integration. So you're doing memory, logic, mm -hmm. analog, mm -hmm. what have you. Your die sizes and wafer sizes need to line up if mm -hmm. you're doing wafer to wafer mm -hmm. integration. If they don't, then you know you go to die to wafer mm -hmm. integration. It depends on what kind of products you're looking at. Part of what it comes down to is how much accuracy do you need. Yes. It's if you're doing die to wafer and you can do uh, a 25 micron pitch, mm -hmm. and that's typically what we do. 25 to 50 is the range for our diet away for type devices. Um, you can tolerate uh, a 5 to 7 micron misalignment mm -hmm. pretty easily. Our absolute limit is actually 10. There are plenty of pieces of equipment that can do that. We have kind of a different twist than most other people. We use the same thermal diffusion bonding both for our wafer to wafer and our diet away for and to give us the alignment and the throughput, we use a template with basically holes cut in it where we mm -hmm. want to put the die, and we pick and place in the template. Mm -hmm. So okay. that gives us a little bit of a speed Do you do a collective bond once you've... Yes, okay. and we bond all the parts simultaneously. Okay. So until you can improve the yield for wafer to wafer, because ultimately that's what it comes down to, is the throughput and yield. Well, it's a simple... It's, it's a, it's a, Simpler process, uh, for lack of a better word, or fewer steps to do wafer to wafer. Ultimately, well, could be a more cost effective. The entire wafer doesn't leave the fab. It's mm -hmm. easy to keep clean. It's easy to clean mm -hmm. and much easier to prepare for a high quality bond as compared to a dye. And also, an alternative to yield would be a redundant design. It's really not the yield of the 3D, which was the problem. It's the yield of the fundamental devices. Mm -hmm. 3D, from what we practice, and I think what several people have at this point can practice, is a relatively high-yielding process, mm -hmm. especially for the level of maturity that it has today. So there's not an issue of having great compromise because of doing 3D. It's just simply that we're building devices that are hundreds and in some cases, we have some that are thousands, small thousands of square millimeters of silicon. If you built a 2D device that was 2,000 square millimeters of silicon, mm -hmm. you're going to have a really, really tiny yield okay. unless you fundamentally change the way you do repair and redundancy. There is a tremendous opportunity, and we see it in 3D, for changing the fundamental approach to repair and redundancy. You really need to rethink how this is done and through process separation and other things that you can do, we get a much better memory yield in 3D than you can accomplish in 2D. Um, we can do things in 3D that you can't. In a 2D memory, if I run out of spare rows or spare columns, I'm done. That's a bad device. Move on. In 3D, if on a particular layer I run out of rows, columns, bit, whatever the redundant element is, I can borrow it from the layer above. It's close by. Mm -hmm. That's something that you can't do, but it requires really a fundamental rethinking of how to architect devices in 3D.